China and the Chinese Navy, obviously, is uh, our business. And how to deal with that rise, obviously, is, um, is a very formidable task. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we all say that uh, uh, history is a product. Uh, we are all, in a very uh, philosophical sense, the product of our past. So tracing uh, back to the interactions between the two navies and then, you know our personnel, and it has always been a very popular topic uh, at the symposium here in Annapolis um, that held every other year. And today we have two very uh, uh, distinguished uh, uh, panelists, um, and uh, they're going to basically uh, do just that and to trace the U.S. Navy and uh, and its interaction with China, with and, and also with uh, China in a very broadly defined area, uh, and uh, going back to the 19th century and 20th century. And so, uh, I'm going to introduce you uh, basically what it is. Uh, if you have your electronic devices, please mute them, um, and then that'll be great. Um, and I think obviously there's a mask uh, requirement uh, as part of the uh, uh, mandated uh, actions here. And what we'll do is uh, uh, we have an hour and 45 minutes. So what I would say is um, uh, each uh, of our uh, panelists would uh, give 20 to 25 minutes of presentation. And then uh, um, I'll make some brief remarks. Uh, and then we'll go to question and answer, right? Uh, so. Um, the, um, the the most difficult part is always uh, introducing the, uh, the the panelists because they're so accomplished. Uh, you never know uh, what you might uh, leave out. Um, so the first, uh, let me just say, uh, uh, Professor uh, Emeritus uh, uh, Bernard Cole. I always go. Uh, I, I always call him uh, Bud. Uh, Professor Cole, and he's the probably uh, one of the most prominent uh, naval historians on China in the field. Everybody who studied Chinese naval history. Or U.S. naval history, uh, uh, and with relationship uh, in relation with China, you must read his books. And he has been the sort of a towering figure in the field. And uh, I don't want to say too much about him uh, because he's serving the Navy, and he uh, he has uh, practiced history, naval history, for 50 years, five zero. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, uh, I'm not going to say much because his paper is uh, is a wonderful reflection about tracking the statecraft uh, of, uh, of uh, doing naval history. So he's going to do, uh, basically uh, insert a lot of his personal experiences in his presentation. So what he did and what, what is the matter. So all you have to know is he's a very prominent historian uh, of distinguished records. Uh, so uh, he just retired from, he's been a, a professor at the National Defense University uh, for many many years, and uh, so he just retired. And congratulations, but and also I just learned a few minutes ago, he's the he's a uh, a glorious resident of Annapolis. So when you, uh, I don't know many many Michigan, you don't like this place that much, but you're in uh, in school. But uh, <laughs> the moment you get out of the place, Annapolis is your spiritual home. You always end up there. Probably in your life. Okay, so that's a living example. Uh, Professor Tommy uh, uh, Jemison is. Uh, from the Naval Postgraduate School in uh, in Monterey, and he is uh, uh, he's written a very fascinating paper about the former midshipmen who end up in China uh, uh, doing some fascinating stuff uh, in the uh, late nineteenth uh, late nineteenth uh, century. And he is assistant professor at Naval Postgraduate School, and he got his PhD from the eminent uh, 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 Educational institution of Harvard, uh, somewhere in Massachusetts, uh, <laughs> um, and he's brand new, 2020, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, um, and he's a former Navy, and he served in the Intel community, and he's going to talk about uh, uh, this uh, midshipman uh, fellow McKibben, and it's a very, very fascinating story. So I, I think what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to start with uh, Professor Cole, if you please, and uh, he's going to uh, present his. Mm -hmm. uh, his, uh, his paper, and uh, then I'll go from there. Thank you. Oh, well, good morning. Delighted to see so many folks here. Um, I was commissioned from the ROTC in 1965. Did not have sailing ships in those days, but it was pretty close. 
There are 30 years of service for officer officers, commanded a frigate in Desron, and also spent a year with the Marines in Vietnam as an able gun fire liaison officer, which is one of the more interesting things I did. Um, I do have to issue a disclaimer that my remarks this morning don't are my own and don't reflect the thoughts of the National War College or the Center for Naval Analysis, where I'm doing some consulting, or the Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, and frankly, at my age, you really don't care a lot about that. <laughs> but the second disclaimer I always want to give is that I'm not Chinese. So when I talk about China and the Chinese Navy and so forth, I'm drawing on 30 years experience as an American naval officer. Uh, I first visited a Chinese warship in January 1994. I last visited one in May of 2014. I've not been to China now for four years and have no plans to go back. Um, I do keep up with it on sort of a daily basis, so I think what I'm going to offer this morning are some remarks that uh, you'll find interesting. And if during the Q&A you'd like to talk about more contemporary events having to do with the uh, People's Liberation Army Navy, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, the first thing I did on China was my dissertation, which was published as Gunboats and Marines, came out in, uh, gosh, 1982, I guess. My most recent work, which was published in November 2016, was called China's Quest for Great Power, Ships, Oil, and Foreign Policy. So my interests have been varied. What I'm going to do this morning is offer some personal experiences with research, starting with the Philippines, then China, then Taiwan, Vietnam, and then China again. <clears throat> and the title of my work, Fact, Fiction, and Sea Stories. Can I have the first, first slide, please? Next slide, right? Just some dictionary definitions, except for the definition of sea story, which I think we're all familiar with. <laughs> That's usually the way a sea story starts. And I first started doing some serious naval research when I was an undergraduate in 1962 at the University of North Carolina looking at, at the Philippines. And it, it's interesting that the role of the missionaries in the Philippines, and of course later the role of the missionaries in China, which reflect directly on the naval missions during the 20th century for the, for the guys who were stationed in China, both Marines and Navy. Now, when McKinley, when the U.S., took the Philippines in 1899-1900, uh, President McKinley, in attempting to justify why we were going to take the Philippines as a colony, offered three sort of pedestrian reasons, and then he came to the one which really sold well. And this is a quote from, the, supposedly a quote from the President. The truth is, I didn't want the Philippines, and when they came to us as gift from the gods, I did not know what to do with them. I'm not ashamed to tell you, gentlemen, he was talking to a, a convention of Protestant uh, ministers, that I went down on my knees and prayed Almighty God for light and guidance more than one night. And he came to his fourth reason, that there was nothing left for us to do but to take them all, to educate the Filipinos, and uplift and civilize and Christianize them, and by God's grace do the best we could by them as our fellow man for whom Christ also died. Now, this story may be apocryphal, although it's been believed by historians ever since he was first quoted. Uh, and I think it would be wrong to condemn on any cultural or religious basis what the president said. I think he was reflecting what was sort of common belief among Westerners at the time, not only towards the Philippines. Go to the next slide, please. This is uh, William Howard Taft. I love this slide. He was the governor, a very effective governor general of the Philippines. Uh, and, and Taft recognized the importance of the Catholic Church in the Philippines and did what he could to support it, in addition to supporting Protestant missionaries. Next slide, please. So not only was the majority of Filipinos already Christian, uh, Roman Catholic, but they had a nascent government, both military and civilian, in place under uh, Aguinaldo. The other, uh, this is Emilio Aguinaldo, and, and then there was Andres Bonifacio and Jose Rosal. And the U.S. simply ignored this. Now, in researching the Philippines back around the turn of the 20th century, I discovered that it was only in 1906 that many of the U.S. consulates acquired typewriters. So if you're going to do research in the years before 1900, you have to deal with the handwriting from some foreign service officers and consular officials who were not necessarily uh, noted for their penmanship. It would be a real challenge. 
I did find, surprisingly, a, a large number of resources of missionary activities, both in the Philippines, uh, elsewhere in Southeast Asia, and Northeast Asia, for that matter, and, and particularly in China. Now, usually we think of missionaries first arriving in China with Marco Polo in the 13th century, but there were some evidence of Nestorian Christians visiting China as early as the 8th century. Not usually recognized, but the first American Protestant missionaries probably occurred in the early 19th century. And these missionaries had a very important effect, I think, on the development of modern China, not so much from proselytization, because a relatively low percentage of Chinese converted to Christianity in the 19th and early 20th century. But most of these missionaries, both men and women, were not just ministers or religious folks. They were YMCA workers, women's rights advocates, uh, physical fitness people, and I think that economists, teachers, I think they had a real effect on the development of of modern China. And moving ahead here, during World War II, and we have to remember that in China, World War II was not four or five years, it was about 15 years, starting with the uh, uh, Manchurian incident in 1931 caused by the Japanese. So it's a very long, very disruptive experience in China, on top of the civil war that began in 1927 between the communist and the Republican elements and what had been the United Front. There's a wonderful museum uh, in Guangzhou, used to be Canton, called the Wampoa Military Museum. And there's a life-size portrait inside the museum, at least there was one when I last visited there, of Sun Yat-sen, the father of the Chinese Revolution, seated in a big fan chair. Chiang Kai-shek, as his military commander, is standing on one side, and Zhou Enlai, as his uh, political advisor, is standing on the other. Now, that united front lasted from about 1924 to 1927, when the two sides sort of mutually attacked each other, which is important because I'm going to talk here later on about the Nanjing incident, which uh, I think you recognize. The Nanjing massacre uh, occurred in 1937, and sort of a touchstone for me for this long 1931-1945 war is the museum in Nanjing, which I first visited when, while it was being constructed many years ago. And I had a group of students from National Defense University with me <clears throat> and two escorting officers from the People's Liberation Army, a senior captain, a senior colonel. And there's, for those of you who don't know, in, in the ranks in the People's Liberation Army go 0106. And then when you're a flag officer, you're immediately uh, uh, a, sort of an upper half rear admiral, if you will, in the Navy. And there's a rank in between, senior captain or senior colonel. Not considered a flag officer, but it's a little bit of an anomaly. So I had the senior colonel and a young lieutenant with me who I think said he was 25 or 26. And as we went through this sort of gut-wrenching museum, very similar to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, uh, one of my students asked this young lieutenant what he thought. And he got very emotional and he said that he, uh, now I understand, this is a direct quote, now I understand why my grandparents and my parents hate the Japanese. Now, he was not unique in that experience, and I think that this experience in China, which has been passed down from generation to generation, today still has a strong influence on China's attitude towards Japan, as, as well as the Koreans, both North and South Korea's attitude towards Japan. So this is a historical incident from decades and almost a century ago now, which still has a very strong influence today in important international relations in Asia. Now, we all know who Mao Zedong was. Okay, by 1936, he had sort of taken over leadership of the uh, Chinese Communist Party and the People's Liberation, what later became the People's Liberation Army. And uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party was founded in uh, 1921 in Shanghai, theoretically in an attic in the French concession, what was then the French concession. There's a museum there. And when I last visited that museum about gosh, 10 years ago now, 15 years ago. As you enter in the lobby, there's this huge mural painted on the on the bulkhead. And uh, it show, and there's a bunch of guys sitting at this long table, and it shows Mao Zedong standing in the middle of the table, holding his little red book up in the air. Now, that's totally BS. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he attended the meeting, but strictly as a very junior guy. And what always amuses me, and I was standing there with one other China guy, looking at this, we both 
almost broke into laughter because it's an exact replica of the Last Supper painting. <laughs> now, whether the artist did that on purpose with a sense of irony or did it out of ignorance, I don't know. But it's, it's a great portrait. Now, communist historians today talk about the, uh, their victory in the Civil War, which ended in 1949 when Chiang Kai-shek and the Republican government moved to Taiwan as well-earned, hard-fought, and proof of the validity of the communist ideology. Obviously, this doesn't sell in Taiwan. And, I, and my own view is that, all that being said, the communists emerged victorious in 1949, not only because of their military victories over a very corrupt Republic of China army, but because the people of China, having been subjected to civil war and invasion since 19th century had finally had enough, and the Communist Party seemed to be the one political element in China in, 19, in the late 1940s able to eliminate the chaos, to stop the Luan, to create a, a, an orderly society, and thus they gained widespread political uh, loyalty. Now, as I mentioned, the Taiwan's obviously, the Republic of China has a different history of this, of what, ha what, what happened. And there's a uh, there's a museum, and, and their view of history is no more objective to our way of thinking than the Chinese Communist Party's is. We have to remember that, that Chiang Kai-shek, when he went to Taiwan in, 19, in the late 1940s, was as much a military dictator, if you will, as Mao Zedong was on the middle of mainland. We all remember the, the islands, offshore islands of Kimoy and Matsu. Kimoy is now called Jinmen, more correctly. And there's a museum on Jinmen. And, and the museum is a memorial to the failed mainland Chinese military attempt to capture Jinmen in the fall of 1949. And that element of the Republic of China military on Jinmen was extremely effective, and they basically slaughtered five to, the 5,000-man assault brigade that was coming from the mainland. So they built this museum, and that's great. Except the last time I visited there, which I think was in 2009, there's a big plaque, and it's, it translates as, Following, it begins by saying, following the victory on the mainland, <laughs> which obviously is, just didn't happen. Uh, so fact fiction, you have to look at both elements when you, when you visit museums like that. Now, sea stories. Uh, I was in, in, uh, in Taipei in uh, 2005 and had been given the name of a retired vice admiral in the Republic of China Navy. And the next slide, please. I'll talk about the sand pebbles here in a minute. Next slide. One of my favorite movies. Next slide. Guy was CEO of this destroyer in 1949, or 48, when he had to move from the mainland to Taiwan. And when I saw him as a retired admiral, or excuse me, retired vice admiral, there was a typhoon bearing down on Taipei. He drove himself to the hotel I was staying at, or the guest house, and we spent about four hours there drinking tea and then a couple of drinks while he told the sea stories. He was disgusted with the Leninist element of the Taiwan military. You know, Leninist military, I use that phrase to describe a military in which you have operational commanders and you have political officers all the way up the chain of command. If you look at a Chinese destroyer today, for instance, if there's a captain as commander of the ship, he'll have another captain as his political commissar. And administratively, the political commissar is senior. One of the reasons he's senior is the officer promotion boards in the People's Liberation Army, uh, up through the rank of commander, are composed of three guys, the chairman of which is always a political commissar. So if you're a lieutenant, if you're a lieutenant and you want to become a lieutenant commander, your political commissar may have the final vote. And on a destroyer, in addition to the, the senior political commissar, each of the port of departments will have a political commissar. So if your department has a lieutenant commander, there'll be a lieutenant commander, political commissar, and ops, weps, engineering, and supply. And in fact, all the way down the chain of command, there'll be political representatives. In other words, if you're on a frigate and there's an electronic warfare work center, what we would call a work center, and there's only three or four people in that work center, and one of those three or four people 
and will be designated as a political party representative to ensure that political party directives that come down to the ship or sent to the ship are briefed to every single sailor on the ship. It's a very thorough system. Now, the same system uh, exists on paper in the Taiwan Navy, uh, but has really faded away in the last decade. In fact, if you ask a Taiwan political commissar what he does, he says, I'm like a chaplain in the U.S. Navy. And he does have some of the same duties, as does the guy in the uh, People's Liberation Army Navy. Now, as Vice Admiral, I asked him about this, and he said, yeah, he said, we had three political commissars on my destroyer, and uh, if we had been attacked by a PLAN ship, by a mainland Chinese ship, the first thing that would have happened with three splashes is we threw these three guys over the side. <laughs> Clearly a sea story. Let me shift to uh, Vietnam. But next slide, please. And this shows President Johnson supposedly picking targets for our airstrikes in Vietnam in the late 1960s. Now, I, you think that any discussion of facts and history would be buttress or sort of validated, validated, excuse me, by eyewitness accounts. And I was directly involved in a relatively recent example of this in the mid-1990s when I was interviewed by Dr. Jack Schulenson, who was a, at the Marine Corps Historic, Historical Center, writing the history of Marine Corps operations in Vietnam in 1968. The Battle of Quezon took place from January to April 1968 during a well-known Tet Offensive. Next slide, please. And you can see here. A sign down here, Long Bay, the Special Forces camp that was overrun, and some of the other. And these, this is just below the border with, uh, with North Vietnam. Now, the U.S. efforts were similar in some ways to the French efforts in the late 40s and early 50s in Vietnam. Uh, and one analogous case to case sign was the French at the Dien Bien Phu. Uh, in Early spring of 1954, the Ambien was a military base created by the French just in the northwest corner of what, late, uh, what later became North Vietnam. Now, Quezon was, of course, not the defeat for the U.S. that the Ambien Phu was for the, uh, for the French, but President Johnson reportedly several times asked the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Tet Offensive if they were confident that Quezon would be held and would not become another, this is supposedly a direct quote, another damn Din Din Phu. The answers are apparently always yes, but the presidential interest on a daily basis no doubt left the Quezon situation a priority higher than any other of the battles during the Tet Offensive, except maybe for the uh, invasion of the American Embassy in Saigon during the Tet Offensive, and that was a relatively brief affair. Now my, my remarks today are, are focused on late February 68, when the NBA forces around Quezon launched thousands of rounds of artillery fire at us. Um, I was on watch in the Fire Support Command Center all this particular day and most of the night, and my, the focus of my activity as the target intelligence officer, assistant target intelligence officer, uh, was to locate the sources of the NVA artillery fire and find targets for our own supporting arms, and from Marine Corps and Army artillery as well, from, as well as from Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps attack aircraft. In retrospect, a great instance of joint work there. I should note that when I, I had been with a, an infantry battalion, 1-3, out in the field for five months when I got orders to transfer over to Quezon, and I remember standing in front of the assistant personnel officer, this major for the 1st Infantry, the Marine Corps 1st Division, explaining to him that Quezon was out of range of naval gunfire, and since I was a naval gunfire liaison officer, perhaps I should go somewhere else. Uh, I got no sympathy at all. <laughs> Instead, was directed over to a helo pad, which was probably mortared as I waited for a helo to take me up to Quezon. The artillery, I was attached to Quezon to the artillery, to the 1st Battalion, 13 Marines, which is the Artie Battalion up there. Um, and my job in the Fire Support Coordination Center did give me a direct view of what was going on in, on a day to day basis. And in fact, when, uh, when I was asked to talk about Quezon, uh, by the Marine Corps Historical Center, I found myself uh, in company, we never actually met that time, with a Marine Corps captain who was in command of an infantry co company on one of the hills around Quezon. It was 881 South, 881 North, and 991. 
And this hill lay in a direct line of fire from the Quezon military base to Koroc, C-O-R-O-C, which was uh, sort of an L-shaped mountain in Laos across the border. And that was the location of much of the NVA artillery firing at, at Quezon. Now, I observed the primary stream of incoming arty on that particular day originating from a bearing towards Koroc and was calling in B-52 strikes to try to suppress it. The Marine commander on a hill reported the primary stream of fire that same day from quite a different bearing. Both of us were trained observers. Both of us were experienced in Vietnam. Both of us clearly remembered what we'd observed and we didn't agree. And yet we were both theoretically eyewitness accounts. So which one of us is correct? Uh, I don't know how Jack wrote that up. I left that problem up to him. Uh, but even an eyewitness account, obviously, even 25 years after the effect, after the, the fact, uh, lies somewhere between facts, sea story, I don't know. Let me go back to China now. Uh, the events I'm now going to discuss occurred during the Northern Expedition, launched in 1924 as a joint venture, as I mentioned, between nationalist and communist forces to try to unite China. The campaign was strongly anti-foreign, as, as you'd expect. The military attaché in, in uh, Beijing, Major John Magruder, U.S. Army, <clears throat> reported that according to consular reports, anti-foreign feeling is steadily increasing. Missionaries state that they have been lately been uh, affronted as never before, and foreigners are commonly addressed as, quote, foreign dogs, unquote, spat upon and filtered with mud and other filth. Um, now, I particularly had to deal with both with all fact fiction and sea stories while researching the events that occurred in 1920s on the Officer River. Uh, a great book of the period, if you go back a couple slides, the attempt to go more, that one, right there. It's a great movie. Uh, the author, Sam Pebbles, the author, a retired chief machinist mate named Richard McKenna, who I met very briefly in, in Chapel Hill when I was an undergraduate there, uh, wrote both fact, fiction, fact and sea stories. In fact, Everything that occurs in San Pablo occurred to some U.S. or British or other gunboat during the first 30 years of the 20th century. So he took these factual events, fictionalized them, uh, particularly the love affair between Candace Bergen and Steve McQueen. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. Uh, <laughs> during, that, nice if it had. <laughs> during that decade. Uh, two important episodes in the book. One was the battle. How many people have seen the movie? Great flick. If you haven't seen it, do so, please. Um, it shows when the fictional USS San Pablo, next slide, please. And this is identical to, to one of the U.S. gunboats that was on the Yonkers River in the 20s. Tries to break through a barrier established on the river, probably the Yonkers, and winning a somewhat pyrrhic victory, followed by a second episode, the rescue of would-be self-martyring missionaries. And the rescue included the death of the story's main character, Steve McQueen, who was playing an E6 machinist mate. The river battle almost certainly follows or is copied from the Battle of Wang Tien that occurred on the Upper Yangtze River in September 1926. Local warlord Yang San seized a couple of British-owned freighters. And he did this periodically to help transport his troops around the area as he tried to establish superiority in that part of China. Uh, he did this in August 20, 1926, and the local British Admiral had had enough. So a British gunboat, U.S. HMS Cockchafer, think about being CEO of that ship, Cockchafer arriving, uh, already at Wan Xian was joined by another gunboat, HMS Widgeon. These were the, obviously the bird-class gunboats. Uh, and also on hand was Xiao Wo, a small commercial steamer the Royal Navy had seized from its Chinese owner. Apparently payback was fine. Uh, they sandbagged a small freighter, armed it with machine guns, and manned it with a party of British sailors uh, commanded by the XO of HMS Dispatch, a local British cruiser commander. And the XO laid his, his would-be gunboat alongside the two captured steamers and figured he could free them and their British officers. But Yang Sen, the local warlord, had, had anticipated this and established a very effective ambush. The XO, two lieutenants, and four enlisted guys from the cruiser were all killed. All the other officers and 13 enlisted men were wounded. 
and the, the Navy failed in its mission and had to withdraw. And then just to add insult to injury, both Cockchafer and Widgeon ran aground as they backed off from the, from the port. Almost just out of peak, the, this, the, uh, the British cruiser fired a bunch of maybe 100 rounds of six-inch fire into the city of Wanxian, accomplishing nothing but intensely increasing anti-foreign fielding in China at the time. But what was really important about that is, is the Chinese learned that the Western navies were not indomitable and could be defeated. I think it was very significant. Now, the, the next incident, the model for McKenna's missionary rescue, was the Nanjing incident that took place in March of 1927. As the communist and, and uh, Republican armies moved north, uh, they came to the city of Nanjing, which uh, translates as southern capital. It occasionally has been the capital of, of China. In 1977, when I was researching for my dissertation, somebody suggested that I come over here to Annapolis and talk to the head of the Alumni Association, since the Shipmate magazine periodically carried accounts of the old Asiatic fleet. So I walked into the Alumni Hall downtown here, and this very distinguished gentleman was sitting there as head of the Alumni Association. I introduced myself and said I was interested in the Nanjing incident. He had this big smile on his face and introduced himself as Captain Roy C. Smith III, retired. And he said, my father, Lieutenant Commander Roy C. Smith, Jr., was the commanding officer at USS NOAA, one of the destroyers at Nanjing, and I was on board as a 14-year-old. Hmm. Well, that sort of serendipity doesn't happen very often. Uh, but not only was he very free with his remarks about the incident, but he was also able to put me in touch with some of these enlisted guys who'd been involved on the USS NOAA and USS Preston, which were two destroyers at Nanjing, during an incident in 1927. And so this was a, a pure luck on my part, but it really uh, helped enormously, as you, as you might expect. Now, the American consul in, in Nanjing anticipated the trouble and moved when the attack started, when the Chinese troops started attacking Nanjing, <clears throat> to Sakoni House, which was the local residence of the Standard Oil representative in Nanjing located right on the river and probably the most impressive Western residency in the city. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Smith, CEO of the NOAA, conferred with Captain Hugh England, great name for the CEO of a British cruiser, uh, and they agreed to cooperate. There was also a Japanese and a French destroyer president named Jane who ignored the whole thing. They did not participate. French destroyer not agreeing to act with a U.S. destroyer. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> The two destroyers sent 11 sailors ashore under the command of an ensign to help man defend Sakoni House. The British cruiser sent a landing party of one Navy lieutenant and one Marine captain ashore, apparently thinking that would be enough. Uh, Chinese troops entered Nanjing the night of 23 March and immediately began attacking the consuls. They killed the Japanese consul, uh, wounded some American missionaries. Uh, it was not a happy time. And they also began attacking Sakoni House. Uh, in return with machine gun fire, in return for which the American sailors began returning fire with only with rifles, which is the heaviest thing they had. Now that quieted things down temporarily, but the next day when the Chinese decided to attack again, a signal party in Sakoni House signaled out to the destroyers and the British cruiser and got naval gunfire support, which drove the Chinese troops away. Now, I corresponded and talked on the phone briefly with the uh, <coughs> first class guy named John D. Wilson, who came from USS NOAA, and he, he told me the following. I went up to on the roof to receive signals and had the misfortune of having to do a bit of ducking as there was a machine gun up in a clump of trees that was trying to discourage me from getting up. I would fire a few shots from my 45 pistol, send some more signals, and have to duck. Anybody who's been in ground combat has to take that with kind of a grain of salt. Let's say more Trump clothes, that's right. But he did get a Navy cross on him. Um, but the Chinese troops were dispersed by the ground support fire, naval gunfire. And then he, Wilson also related the following colorful description of how the rifles stored in Nanjing were cleaned of their cosmoline. Anybody ever tried to clean cosmoline off a rifle? Mm. It can be a long task. This is a quote from a letter he sent me. 
I personally got a beautiful cut glass bowl and dumped several fifths of Mr. Hobart's, that's the Ciccone guy, scotch into it, and we took the bolts out of the rifle, washed them off in scotch, and got them to work. I later took a glass and went to the bottom of that bowl and got a healthy snifter of the good whiskey and drank it down. Well, realizing it was oily but needed that bracer then and there. The sea story alarm just went off. Okay. But nonetheless, it adds to a colorful description. So the sand pebbles, as I said, draws on historical fact, classified as fiction, and has some really fun sea stories included. Let me talk very briefly about propaganda. Somewhere between fact and fiction, uh, usually intentionally bent and maliciously intended. And one example that I consider propaganda that I've been personally involved with is the current Chinese interpretation of victory in the Korean War. Or as Chinese historians describe it, quote, the war to resist U.S. aggression and aid North Korea, unquote. And the Chinese view, of course, is that the South, South Korea invaded North Korea instead of vice versa. And Chinese civilian academics, think tankers, active duty PLA officers who I've interviewed over the last couple of decades, have consistently offered this view as fact. And the Chinese version is that, quote, the illegitimate lackeys of Western imperialists in the South attacked first. And I have to I have to note that this version is supported by at least one prominent American historian. Um, perhaps most jarring to me is the Chinese insistence that they won the Korean War. And when I pointed out to interlocutors that we look at the number of casualties on both sides, uh, look at the failed attempts by North Korean and Chinese attacks, despite MacArthur's ignorance and blindness, they answer, that doesn't matter. The fact that the DPRK still exists means that we won the war. In fact, there was a big celebration just two weeks ago, I think. They just had this big announcement about Chinese bodies being brought back from from Korea. And one of those bodies was, uh, well, one of the deaths was the son of Mao Zedong, who was with the uh, PLO. Let me conclude. Uh, fact, fiction, and sea stories all, you know, you encounter all these things. And as I think is true in most history graduate programs, uh, I took a was really a very fine historiography course. Uh, and I have to note, I got my PhD at Auburn when I was an ROTC instructor there, and the Navy then proceeded to ignore that for the rest of my career, but that's, that's fine. Uh, learning about Herodotus, Thucydides, Gibbon, and all is, is not as valuable, has not been as valuable to me as just my experience of trying to do research in East Asia, the US, Philippines, Taiwan, China, and elsewhere. Especially sobering has been my own involvement in eyewitness accounts, evidence in a case on example I cited above. I do have to conclude and say that while such accounts will differ markedly, and I think Sand Pebbles is a perfect example of a combination of fact, sea stories, and fiction, and from a Chinese perspective, even propaganda, I don't think it reflects in most cases any intellectual dishonesty, but just the fog and fiction of the work. Something we all have to deal with if we're trying to account for those events. Thank you very much. He goes them off, bud. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We we few we marry few we few we few we marry few we we
I don't think when I, if I deliver this with my mask off, is that a thing? Yeah, yeah. Feel free. It's very difficult to speak with one's glasses on and wear a mask. Yeah, so the, the fogging of the glasses defeats the, the, the point. So thank you so much for the kind introduction, and it's an honor to follow uh, Dr. Bud Cole, and thank you for a fascinating presentation on the intersections of fact, fiction, and, and sea stories. The subject uh, in question today that I will be presenting on lies at exactly this intersection, somewhere along the lines of the historical record and, and myth, um, and, and mythos, even at places like this, the United States Naval Academy. And in some ways, the story starts um, with this image of two uh, buttons. Uh, next, just so to hit the slide, don't play the next one, but yeah, perfect, just like that. Um, the one on the right is from an Imperial Chinese Navy uniform from the Beiyang Fleet, the North Sea Fleet, the most capable Chinese military force, certainly naval force organized during the late Qing uh, Dynasty. Uh, and as you can see, it's clearly modeled on uh, a Royal Navy button, but albeit with Chinese characteristics. Uh, and then the one on the left is, is a little more curious. Um, it's got an eye at the center of it, and I wonder if anyone has a guess about what that might uh, signify. Maybe I can ask one of the midshipmen to take a guess. Eye at the center of a button with an eagle on it. What what country do you think that comes from, Mr. Hilton? You can tell me. Well, the eagle probably gives you a good guess that it's America, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the eye is going to be infantry. Uh, it's a Civil War era button. It's a family heirloom, and it's passed down to our subject, uh, Philo Norton McGiffin, and he sews both of these onto his uniform of the Imperial Chinese Navy, the fleet in which he'll actually. Uh, sir, uh, these are uh, in the Hong Kong Maritime Museum today. They were sold at auction in San Francisco in 2006 uh, and put on exhibit in Hong Kong uh, later that year, about 10 years before the United States Naval Academy organized a similar exhibit uh, to one of its uh, more significant graduates, but also one that's been somewhat forgotten uh, beneath the penumbra of, of, of history. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you very much. So this is the guy in question that we're going to be talking about today, Philo Norton McGiffin. And, and has anyone heard of this person before? So one, two, three, couple of weeks. But uh, any, yeah, well, I get first. I think I'm some of your. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's cheating. Yeah. You know? So, any Naval Academy students heard him before? No? Uh, East West? Okay, well, he's a, a midshipman like you. Um, joins the Academy in uh, 1878 and does so largely as a result of the weight of personal history signified by this U.S. infantry. Uh, but, uh, like many of his generation, he's born with. The sort of the psychological feeling and need to live up to the example of what his forefathers did in the United States Civil War. So this epic existential class, great martial valor on this <coughs> the generation which follows the Civil War feels a lot of weight and uh, a, a lot of need to try to live up to those examples. I think a lot of people can, can empathize with that as human beings. Uh, Kristen Hoganson has a wonderful uh, book on exactly this subject that I, I commend to everyone. The historians in the room uh, will be familiar with it. This is him uh, in dress uniform, 1882. He graduates uh, with his uh, class, and, and he's the person I want to talk about today, um, not only as a subject of a biography that I'm hoping to write as my second book uh, project, uh, but also as a window onto some of the curious intersections of international history and the comparative history of the United States and China at the fin de cycle, or the, the age of empire, the late 19th century, the last years of the 19th century before um, the coming of the United States as one of the, the, the great powers in the international uh, system. Now, he's a, an interesting provocation uh, about China, about the United States, and about their relations across the Pacific, what Henry Melville called the tide beating hard work, oh, a tide beating hard earth, and an early high water mark of globalization. The story starts, as I say, around 1882, uh, the time when this photograph is taken, and it's uh, you know, sort of to the extent that we think of uh, Father Norton McGiffin at all today, uh, it's mostly as a man of, of wit and charm, uh, as a biography, a uh, short biography written about him in proceedings uh, sketched out. Uh, someone who's, who's legendary as a prankster uh, in the United States Naval Academy. And I have it on good authority that up to the late 1970s, midshipmen who had failed to prepare adequately for an exam, not that anybody here would be in, in that category, would actually appeal to the ghost of Philo Norton McGiffin to intervene on their behalf and save them from, from a lack of adequate uh, preparation. And, and that reflects the fact that he spent uh, most of his time sort of rebelling against the stultifying rules of the Naval Academy at the late 19th century, the height of what Peter Preston called uh, naval aristocracy, uh, and, and spending a good uh, deal of his time um, uh, playing pranks and, and, and indulging himself in other Divergence. Uh, th this has a number of problems for McGiffin, though, because uh, as a result of all his, shall we say, extracurricular activities, he graduates towards the bottom of his class. Now, today that might mean you know you don't get the, the branch 
fish you want, you don't get, they're going to submarine or, or, or fly and you get, you end up on a, a destroyer or something like that and you didn't want to. Uh, but at the time, it has much more significant consequences for filing more than the given. Have a nice time, please. Thank you very much. So we, we tend to think of the United States maybe for the last 120 years or so uh, as, as this image uh, of, of the Great White Fleet here anchored off of Monterey Bay. Um, where, where I live today. Uh, this is, if you were to look out on this scene today, you'd be sitting at a really nice beer garden uh, called uh, Dust Bowl Brewing, where I held a seminar about two weeks ago. Uh, we don't have, the, usually it's just sort of you know, nice pleasure yachts today, but in 1908, we have uh, the image of the United States as a rising great naval power. Uh, and that's sort of our impression of the United States Navy and its uh, ability to project uh, US power into the world. Uh, but it's definitely not the case uh, for McGiffin in the 1880s. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, the Navy he enters uh, is a lot more like uh, this uh, cartoon after two uh, decades of naval austerity and cuts following the U.S. Civil War. This is from Harper's Weekly. It's a curious illustration of this moment in history. I wonder if we could uh, sort of try to interpret it together. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't see your, your, your name against the flight right. suit. Lethwick, would, could you take a stab here at trying to see what the message of this, of this cartoon might be, maybe interpret it for us? What do you think is going on? Right? Anybody else? Um, yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, sure. Uh, that looks like a Chilean flag. Yeah, awesome. And uh, well, fortunately, not confusing it with the Texas flag because everyone, you know, that's, that's usually the first guy to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there, there go as well. Uh, and it looks like the Chileans are kind of blowing up the U.S. Navy. Uh, the that's right. Yeah, exactly. And the, the caption helps us out here. Our Navy, even Chile, could warm us. Um, <laughs> this uh, reflects. Uh, oh, man. Yeah, that's, 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 that is what that says. You know, we have to be. You know, we should. Uh, yeah, exactly. So we should. We should be visual and um, and also look to the, the, the written record as well. There. Um, so yeah, uh, this is a, a political cartoon. It reflects a dispute in 1881 between uh, the U.S. Uh, Pacific Squadron and the Chilean fleet, um, and uh, it, 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 harsh words were exchanged, uh, and uh, eventually cooler heads prevailed, which was for the Probably for the better, because at the time it was likely that Chile's two seagoing ironclads could have destroyed any of the wooden hulled, smooth cannon, uh, muzzle loading, smooth bore um, armed uh, wooden cruisers in the U.S. Pacific Fleet at the time. Uh, Alfred Bayer Mahan is actually off the coast of Chile and Peru uh, almost exactly the, the same time uh, as this cartoon is made, and witnesses uh, something similar. So, to this, Philo uh, Norman Giffen. His only service on a naval vessel comes uh, on his midshipman cruise around the world, and he'll be off the coast of South America in 1884, witnessing firsthand exactly the sort of delta between the power of the United States Navy and the power of even its inter-American rivals. Um, okay, so what does this mean, next slide please, for Philo Norton uh, McGiffin? Uh, well, it, it means that not only is he not allowed uh, to get the job he wants in the Navy because of his poor academic uh, performance in the United States Naval Academy, but he's not able to get a position at all. There simply aren't enough billets in the seagoing Navy until he's released from service and released from the service obligation. And this puts him in a real pickle, right? He's got all this training, all this experience. He's dedicated his life to becoming a fighting uh, man. He emphasis on, on the word man and the codes of masculinity encoded in that. Uh, but he has no place to serve. He certainly can't serve in, uh, in his own uh, military. Uh, but luckily for McGiffin, uh, the United States is not while the United States Navy is sort of backward and just beginning to stir into a, a moment of modernization, uh, an epic naval expansion is already underway in Qing China. And it's been on, ongoing since the, the late 1870s and is really accelerating uh, by the 1880s. And we have an example of this, the Zhuyun um, cruiser uh, being built in uh, Newcastle um, uh, in, in, the, in the 1880s, late 1880s, this is 1886. Um, this drive is not only about creating shipyards and acquiring hardware, though it's very much about that, and it's very impressive in that regard, but it's also about uh, <coughs> talent uh, and foreign advisors who are capable of manning and training um, a fleet uh, of, of personnel that will actually uh, man, train, and equip uh, these weapon systems. Um, Li Hongzhong, the most significant, I think you can say, Chinese diplomat and official of his age and one of the key modernizers of this period uh, has the observation uh, that if you guys can go in. No, it's, it's well, the door is locked, apparently. You guys, can't, you guys may come in, but you can't come in. So you can't in. Uh, Lee Hong is one of the, the key modernizers of his age, and he has an observation that in all things, all things 
uh, need talent. Sure, sure. Suicide. All things at this moment in time need talent, uh, and they need to acquire foreign advisors is one of the ways he goes about uh, filling this. Uh, we tend to see this moment uh, in retrospect as something of a failure, but at the time, it's a protean effort at naval modernization that seems full of possibilities for, accept, for success. Uh, and that's, that's very much clear to the senior U.S. naval diplomat of his, his era, Commodore Robert Wilson uh, Schufeldt, who arrives in China on a diplomatic mission in the early 1880s and is immediately impressed by the possibilities of this naval modernization uh, movement. And he actually writes in a letter to Li Hongzhong, uh, quote, should China, do China should dominate uh, the waters which wash its shores and exercise a commercial influence on the water. Actually, hold on, sir. Yeah, I was, uh, was, was going to just suggest uh, unlocking the door because I think I figured out how to do that. Okay, there's a few more coming. Okay, so let's let's try that again. So we're we're talking about this particular moment in history in the eighteen 80s when China is undergoing a, a massive fleet modernization and expansion. We're talking about some of the challenges it faced in doing uh, so, and also some of the possibilities and opportunities. And in particular, looking at the story of one American naval advisor who will travel to China to assist in this effort, Kyle Norton McGibbon, who graduates from this very institution in 1882. So, as I say, uh, historians usually take a pretty dim view of Chinese naval modernization, the foreign affairs movement, the Yang Wu Yundong in the late 19th century, but none of this is obvious. It's not obvious that the foreign affairs movement will come to grief to the people who are living through this as a, a, as a personal uh, experience in real time. Uh, consider the observations of Commodore uh, Russell uh, W. Schufeld, who arrives in China on a diplomatic mission in the 1880s. And he observes to Li Hongzhong, the senior naval modernizer of his era, well, certainly diplomat, one of the leading naval modernizers of the era, uh, that, quote, China should dominate the waters which wash its shores and exercise a commercial influence upon the Pacific Rim, it may be taken for granted that with a proper system of coast defense, both naval and military, no Western power could attack China without any prospect, uh, with any prospect of permanent success. Right? So this is sort of a story about the possibilities of Chinese naval modernization. It's something that's very obvious to the senior U.S. naval officer on station uh, in, in the 1880s. Uh, slide, please. As I say, McGiffin is one of the agents of this uh, transformation. Uh, he travels to uh, China in 1885. And in 1885, what's going on in China in terms of, of naval history? Anyone? 1885, late 1880s? Uh, yeah, go for it. Well, that's, that's close. Yeah, so it's a conflict with foreign powers for sure. 1883, 1885, anybody? Sino French. Right, so this is this is sort of, this is a, this is the conflict between France and China over influence in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's, it has a, a really fascinating naval dimension as well. And Philo Norton McGiffin, who has just been lost his position in the United States, maybe sees it as an opportunity to volunteer for combat duty. Uh, and he travels to China, uh, accredited with the Iowa Strait Register as a press agent. Uh, but really, his ambition is to volunteer his services to Li Hongzhong to run a torpedo boat uh, and to organize a torpedo flotilla to attack. The, uh, French fleet to use an asymmetric coastal defense technology to upset the material advantages uh, and material superiority of the French fleet, which has otherwise uh, defeated the main uh, battle force of China. Now, he arrives a little late uh, for the conflict, and Li Hongzhong seems better than uh, sending him out uh, in charge of, of what may well be a forlorn hope, but he's uh, right in time to begin picking up the pieces after the failure of the Southern Seas fleet. Uh, in 1885, and, and to take some of the lessons of that failure and apply it to the North Sea fleet uh, as it continues its expansion and its improvements throughout the 1890s, uh, moving forward towards the sign of Japanese War. This is his, his uniform uh, and his ceremonial sword that's given to him uh, while uh, stationed in China. Initially, he is a torpedo warfare instructor at the Naval Academy in Tianjin, and then he moves in 1885 to the port city of Wei Highway and founds the Naval Academy for the North Sea Fleet. So here we have a person who graduates from the U.S. Naval Academy and then founds a Naval Academy in China. He's the superintendent there at the tender age of 27. So uh, here's his Christmas card uh, from Wei Highway in 1891. This is probably the peak in terms of, abs in absolute terms and relative terms of Chinese naval 
uh, strength in 1891, uh, the North Sea Fleet will go on a tour uh, of, of East Asian waters to Japan to really impress Japanese military officials and, and politicians with uh, its, its power and significance as, as what is likely the dominant naval force in the region. Um, it's, as, as I say, it's his, his Christmas card uh, enjoying his position as the uh, superintendent of the uh, Naval Academy at Wei Hai Wei. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in his position here. I'm interested in what it was like to live in this port city at this time. I'm interested in what it was like to try to transfer knowledge from uh, the United States to China at this time. But I'm also interested in uh, McGiffin as an agent of transnational history and comparative history, if I can make it historiographical uh, case. Slide, please. It's interesting to see him not only as an American who goes abroad with a case to, to make for the Chinese, as always bringing education to China, but also as someone who's part of a broader milieu of circulation about naval technology and expertise in the late 19th century. I, I like to see him alongside uh, men uh, like uh, Lin Sajong at uh, right here, and also Yen Fu. Uh, these are both men who will uh, be educated at the uh, British Naval War College in Greenwich. Uh, this looks actually very much like the United States Naval Academy, only sort of turned up uh, to 11. Uh, and they bring back uh, knowledge to China and they adapt it curiously to local conditions. Uh, McGiffin will serve alongside Lin at the Battle of the Yalu in 1894 on board the Chinese battleship Zhengzhen. Uh, and he will serve in sort of a parallel or tandem, I guess, to Yen Fu uh, as a, a, a senior uh, official in the naval education system of China in the late 19th century. Yen Fu is the superintendent of the uh, Tianjin Naval School. McGiffin is just down the road, uh, maybe, maybe 150 <coughs> miles at another city called uh, Wei Hai Wei, leading a parallel uh, uh, naval academy, uh, one that will exist until 1895. Uh, slide, please. Uh, McGiffin is not just an instructor, he's also an advisor to the Chinese uh, military who will take part in what is likely the most significant naval uh, battle of the late 19th century, maybe the most significant naval battle of the 19th century, uh, save the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, I don't know, what do you think? But, Something like that, right? Battle of the Yali is up there. I don't know. It sounds like a little too grand. Okay, it sounds a little too grand. That's fair enough. But a, uh, uh, a, an epoch sort of marking battle in the regional geopolitics of East Asia. And he'll serve alongside, uh, as I said, Lin Saidong on board the genuine battleship. Um, the, the Battle of the Yali is a, a fascinating uh, study. Uh, Japan wins quite handily, mostly as a result of superior quick fire and guns on board its cruisers and the fecklessness of Chinese long-range naval artillery. Uh, but there are a lot of mini dramas within it, which I think are worth bringing to the fore. Uh, one of the key results for McGiffin is that he, he suffers quite grievously for his pains. He's very severely wounded and burned as a result of service on board the Genuine, though it is it's saved alongside his sister battleship, the Genuine, and brought back to the port city of Wei Hai Wei. Uh, he'll carry within him uh, 70 uh, splinters, wooden and metal splinters, as a result of the battle. And he's also very badly burned. Um, this photo was taken in Wei Hai Wei uh, shortly after his interview with William Snowden Sims, maybe the senior, most significant U.S. naval innovator of his age, uh, who's the intelligence officer on board a U.S. ship and, and meets with McGiffin in the immediate aftermath of the Battle of the Yalu. Slide, so, please. So uh, his story in China ends here. He's invalidated out of the Chinese Navy. He's too severely injured to stay in China and returns to the United States, and he takes up a position uh, as a lecturer of sorts. Uh, this is one of these curious little ironies of history. Uh, someone who was effectively uh, ousted from the United States Navy, who was, forbidden, who was unable to join the United States Navy as a junior officer, actually makes a pretty significant mark on US naval culture in the late 19th century, lecturing at the United States <coughs> Naval War College. Uh, he's invited uh, to give uh, a lecture on the nature of the battle of the Yalu and what uh, the United States Navy and its uh, senior tacticians and operational specialists might take away from uh, its lessons. So someone who's been kicked out of the Naval Academy, or well, not kicked, he graduated from the Naval Academy, but kicked out of the fleet as a junior officer, nonetheless enjoys a position lecturing uh, at the Naval uh, War College. In some ways, this is sort of a, 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 maybe I'm attracted to this because it, uh, it reminds me of myself. The joke in my family is that I was such a cruddy junior officer that I had to come back as a Navy civilian and teach at the Naval Postgraduate School, which is like, <laughs> which is like a funny joke until your dad says it to you, and then it kind of, kind of hurts a little bit, you know, it kind of feels the same. So uh, it's a significant uh, posting, as I say, and so you know, just five years 
after the publication of the influence of sea power on history. Here you have someone with real experience on how sea power affected the geopolitics and history of East Asia, bringing those lessons back and teaching at the uh, United States Naval War College. Slide, please. Happy times don't last, though. In 1897, McGiffin uh, commits suicide. Um, there's a really cruel word for it uh, here. Uh, I think it's nervous debility, nervous debility, um, which is a pretty unfair characterization of, of what I think we can see as a, um, a, an early case of post-traumatic stress disorder and also a result of really severe and chronic uh, pain that he had as a result of his physical wounds from the Battle of the Yalu. Slide, please. This story is a fascinating one, I think. There's a lot of human drama to it, but it largely gets subsumed uh, underneath some uh, other historiographical debates that are taking place, um, uh, that take place in the 20th century. The 20th century sort of consumes the story of, of rivalry between China and Japan in the late Qing period um, as we look forward to uh, another epoch defining uh, conflict uh, between the United States and Japan, that is World War II. So some of the real prestigious historiographical questions of the 20th century are why did, why did the United States and Japan fight uh, during World War II? And, and, and that takes up a great deal of, of diplomatic uh, attention by diplomatic and military historians. And you get a sense of, of why, because uh, a serious uh, naval race for capability is underway between the United States and Japan as early as 1897. Uh, this is a, a, a picture of the battleship Yoshima uh, being outfitted uh, in, in Newcastle, just down the road from the shipyard that built the Chinese warship that we saw in the earlier photographs. But it's, but to say, it's kind of a, a story that's that's lost to history, or at least seen as a subcurrent of the history, uh, it, it's certainly in the United States. Uh, but a curious thing is happening today as the rise of China makes it newly relevant in the way we see the past, and that is that the lessons of the Sino-Japanese War are literally being dug up for historical and propagandistic uh, purposes, right? Um, this is an image from the front page. I guess it's the splash page. It's like the first page you see on a website of a newspaper. I guess it's the splash page. Um, but the splash page are front page of, of Xinhua in September 18, uh, 2020, and it's uh, an article documenting the, an underwater archaeology expedition to literally dig up, to unearth from the mud of Wei Highway, uh, battleship armor from the Jingyuan, a ship that sunk in the final Japanese invasion of Wei Highway in 1895, uh, and done so for the purposes of remembering not necessarily humiliation, but also uh, a testament to a, a moment in time when, it, to, to the length of time that China has resisted Japanese imperialism and Japanese power in Northeast Asia. Slide, please. This isn't just about underwater archaeology and academic papers, though it certainly is uh, a, a case of that. There's a, a good deal of academic ferment about what the Sino-Japanese War meant, means to Chinese history and, and what role foreign observers uh, and, and activists and agents played in it. Uh, but it's also something that we see playing out in Chinese propaganda uh, films like this one from 2012, which is actually like an okay one. It's like a pretty good one. This one's okay. Uh, I, I recommend uh, uh, this one for anyone who, who's interested in understanding the way uh, Chinese propaganda portrays um, the Sino-Japanese relationship and, and uh, frictions uh, therein in uh, late 19th century late Qing <coughs> history. McGiffin's actually in this, but he's sort of a, a clownish figure who has a couple of throwaway lines and who advises a cowardly course of action during the Battle of the Yalu, and I think that's a shame, uh, and I think there's clearly an opportunity to rescue uh, his image from propagandists who might otherwise mistreat him. Slide, please. Okay, so so what? Old, unhappy, faraway things and battles long ago. Why has this guy been droning on to me at uh, 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning for so uh, long? Well, I think this is a, a story about a person, but it has a number of significant so what variables uh, of historiographical uh, implications that might uh, make it more relevant, uh, more widely. Uh, so, sort of animation, please. Yeah, there you go. It's a human drama. Yep, hit it. Uh, he's a cult figure uh, at the Naval Academy for many years, but he's also an interesting uh, vehicle to look at things like post-traumatic stress disorder and the weights of personality and the need to live up uh, to cultures of martial uh, masculinity uh, and so forth. Slide, please. Uh, but I also think he's, he's much more important as sort of a story about uh, transnational modernization, a, a vector of naval modernization or even modernity, capital M modernity, in China. Slide, please. Uh, is he a military contractor? Do we see him as an early example of a mercenary or a uh, forerunner of the people who work for like Lockheed Martin or uh, North of Grumman today? Uh, it's also an interesting story of comparative history between figures like Yen Fu and McGiffin, sort of parallel stories of naval academies that are both operating in northern China in the late 19th century. Slide, please. Uh, do we see him as a figure who's primarily giving advice or as someone who's uh, participating in commerce? Go ahead. 
Uh, and then also it's a provocation about Sino-US uh, relations. Obviously, we live in a period uh, that forecasts a, a pretty a dim future for the United States and China, uh, destined for war uh, is one of the, the more uh, uh, commonly observed uh, destined for war is a, a, a commonly <coughs> read and, and, and again, very gloomy forecast uh, for the future of the United States and China. And so I'm interested in, in little historical ironies like this one uh, of, of, of the history of the United States and China on a longer timeline than just post-1949, the longer timeline that someone like uh, Dr. Cole has reminded us of this morning uh, to a moment when, in fact, there are, are many examples of the United States and China cooperating. Uh, and here's an example of someone who's not in the United States Navy outside of the United States Navy, uh, but is nonetheless an American serving uh, in China uh, as an agent uh, to strengthen Chinese naval power. And that's one of the curious ironies that I think helped surprise people in history. And one of the things that I hope keep people turning, turning books that they might one day buy uh, on a bookshelf. Uh, so thanks everybody for your time today. I look forward to any sort of questions. So uh, I'm doing my um, obligatory uh, part of the uh, panel, which is to make some comments. Uh, it's it's a very interesting to um, uh, it's actually fascinating to read the two papers, uh, and uh, because they all deal with uh, um, individuals um, of extraordinary uh, uh, accomplishment and uh, in extraordinary historical circumstances. Let me first uh, comment about. Uh, um, uh, Professor Cole's paper. Uh, th this paper is is absolutely amazing to, for me to read it, uh, about it because it deals with something that's far uh, beyond a uh, a reflection by someone who has practiced history uh, for fifty years, who has served in the U.S. Uh, Navy for thirty years uh, concurrently, I might say, but so not consecutively. Uh, the most important thing, obviously, is um, it's uh, it's it's about um, the question of what is history. History can be many things, as the uh, the paper uh, tells us. History, first of all, is uh, the memory. If we want to reconstruct what happened in Kaesan in Vietnam, we talk to people who participated in that. Right, that's basically the uh, one of the uh, very interesting story about that. So history is memory. Uh, history is also about fact, about artifact. You go to the Naval Academy Museum, just the one building over. You see the cast rings uh, of, of the past. You see the uh, swords of uh, Commodore Barry. And so those are I know, ship models. And so those are also history. Um, history is also, it's it's, uh, it's record. You go to some 30 miles from here, you go to the National Archives in, um, uh, uh, in uh, College Park. And there are a ton of stuff. Those are unprocessed records. So. Historians basically uh, live uh, by those records. As a matter of fact, when I get out of my graduate school from uh, the wonderful place called Berkeley, California, I came here um, not to seek ideological opposition, but <laughs> actually uh, <laughs> just to be close to the record. Uh, uh, so, so history is an unprocessed record. History is also, I mean, those things you read do not make much sense unless somebody actually go there to work on those memory records and facts and write into a volume and publish it. Uh, and you get the tenure and uh, life will be glorious after that. So history is also about the written reconstruction of the past. And then there are so many books you publish every year and uh, by historians. Um, and so those were professional history books and also memoirs also included. Uh, but since there are so many books written, and there must be different opinions, different takes, different approaches, and this paper also deals with that. Uh, and uh, therefore, there must be interpretation of the written reconstruction of history. And that interpretation of the written reconstruction of history is called historiography. Historiography deals with something that's much bigger than the actual history book itself, the narrative itself. But then historiography can also be very, very controversial. So somebody has to be critical, has to critique those interpretation of history as written. And that branch of historical inquiry is called the philosophy of history. Um, so uh, obviously you have people, 
like Hegel and a lot of people who deal with the philosophy of history, and they deal with actually methods and approach to acquire historical knowledge, something called epistemology. And uh, that's a good word for Michelle Fan to learn, because you'll, you'll impress your taste. So I hope that we can, <laughs> if you can use this word. So. so the wonderful thing about this presentation by Professor Cole is that this paper contains all elements I just mentioned. History and uh, so, and it's, 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 a, it's a deeply philosophical MSA and it's also a, a very personal thing. Uh, and uh, it deals with the fog of historical writing, uh, which brings me to the next question. This paper uh, uh, that deals with uh, that is the purpose of history. What is the purpose of history? Why there are there so many thousands of historians? Why are there so many history majors here? Why do you are you interested in this? Just for his sort of curiosity, you know, he watched History Channel, and that's all. No, there is something much, much noble, much more noble, and much more sincere, and that is to find the truth. Okay? That's the purpose of history, to find the truth. So this paper deals with deals with uh, uh, truth. Now, how do you find the truth? What is the what is the sort of an intellectual prerequisite to pursue this noble no mission? Of finding the truth, and from the code paper also talk about this. First of all, you must have a faith in the existence of truth. There is a truth there to be found. So I can see the agony of from the code when he confronted all this untruth, all this manipulation of truth. If you don't have faith in the existence of truth. Historical pursuit will become one propaganda, yeah. right? So that's basically the story that he was telling us about the origin of the Korean War. That's a story he was telling us about uh, uh, the uh, the narrative at the Kimoi. That's a his, uh, story he's telling us about about uh, the stories in Nanjing and many other places, right? So this is why you must have intellectual prerequisite. That is the faith in the existence of truth. Now, this paper also deals with four basic aspects of historical narratives. That is fact, fiction, sea story, and propaganda. Uh, so in each of the sections, this paper deals with uh, 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 the pursuit of history. And so the ultimate question is, can all this form of historical telling, fact, Fiction, say story, and propaganda <coughs> tell the truth. In other words, is there historical objectivity? And that brings me to uh, this great book <laughs> that I read. I asked my mission to read it when they have the, the guts to read it. It's a history. It's called the That Noble Dream. It's written by a professor at the Chicago University of Chicago, and Peter Nolan. It's about the deal with uh, it's intellectual history about the history of the concept of objectivity in the history field since the late 1890s, since the time of Ranka and since the time of Charles Beard, since the time of, uh, of, 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 uh, of Degler. All those people deal with it because this is actually very, very essential. Now, can fact be truthful? Well, there is maybe, may not, maybe not, because you all memory. Many people think that I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the fact. As you know, there is some kind of you know, uh, 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 sort of opaqueness in that. The story of Kaesong, for example, right? Two guys participating in an actual battle could tell a totally different story. Right? Now, fiction can fiction tell the tell the truth and fulfill the ultimate goal mission of historical inquiry? Who's right? right? McKenna, Sam Pebble. To what extent a fiction can tell us the truth about history? So. Obviously, people from a different intellectual cultural background may have a different interpretation of that. 
if you uh, if you uh, uh, have a Chinese cultural upbringing, you will know the Chinese painting. They don't really paint it exactly. There is a very very sort of ob obvious conspiracy absence of realism, as we see in the West. They paint the tree. A tree sort of looks like a tree, but it's not a real tree. It's spiritually there. You know, there's a sense and a machine. You no, know, those are very different ones. And in the West, you, you, you paint the Mona Lisa. It's very detailed. It's, it's, it's try to find the actual thing. Some people may not tell you the historical facts as true, as true, but it does tell you the zeitgeist. It does tell you the true spirit of the time. Just as social nations archipelago, uh, Gulag archipelago can tell you the real historical reality of the Soviet Union and the communist regime, but the whole book is a fiction. Doesn't exist. So that's why there's the two layers of the truth that we have to be very careful. So fiction is, is that too. C story, obviously. When we say C story, there is a there is a sort of a implied that this is just bullshit. <laughs> but uh, but history can also be true, right? You can tell you part of the truth. So, so which obviously propaganda is complete the manipulation of truth. It's purpose to distort truth for different purposes. So that we should really discard. So which brings me to the to the to the book that noble dream. That noble dream was the title of a speech given by the eminent American historian Charles Beard at the American Historical. Association annual meeting in which the president of American Historical Association doesn't believe the objectivity of the history. He believes memory can be very, you know, uh, 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 flexible uh, and it can be very different. And uh, no history is true. Therefore, all the history written so far has been manipulated. So he's, 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 he's a very Marxist. Charles Beard is a. He, it is very left wing, uh, but he doesn't believe that. That's why history can be subject to interpretation according to your personal feelings, your personal mm -hmm. understanding. He he ridiculed the argument for historical objectivity uh, advanced by this very famous German historian um, uh, Raka, right? R A N K E. And he called it that noble dream. He, he's mocking that, right? So it's a dream. You, there's no dream. But you think about this: having a dream is not bad. You might not reach 100% objectivity, but you always try to aspire to find the truth as close as you can, right? So I think that is what Dr. Cole is trying to achieve. He's always in search of that absolute truth, even though it may not be achievable in the end, but at least we should have a faith in truth and historical objectivity. So that's what I get away with that paper. Okay, so thank you very much. But it's a wonderful uh, So, uh, yes. Oh, I was waiting. I was just getting my hand up for when you were starting to ask for people who had questions. Yeah, let me finish, finish uh, very briefly to the next paper, and then we have, we have uh, about uh, uh, half an hour or so. Uh, so the paper by uh, Dr. Jameson is also wonderful because, uh, but also it's very agonizing for me as a professor here because this paper is authored by uh, the guy who is actually graduated at the bottom of the class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, to become this historic paper, right? You, history. you too can aspire to history. Uh, so so uh, well, there, there, uh, obviously in the in the brigade there is a culture of the glorification of the anchorman. So uh, every time uh, 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 the guy is uh, 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 graduate, there's a Thunders, thunders, applause for that. Uh, but this is a um, so the Anchorman versus uh, the Zeman ship is a sort of a, a legendary, a legendary uh, uh, lore here um, at the Naval Academy. Uh, this also obviously deals with the leadership. Now uh, it didn't start with 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 the McKibben. No, look up. I mean, the most famous native son of an Alfred is John McCain. John McCain graduated, I think, second from the bottom. Yeah. And so he you know, uh, uh, went, went on to, to have a glorious career. Um, I have actually had a uh, Michigan Bank graduate about uh, 15 years ago. I shall not know his name. <laughs> uh, 
uh, because he just uh, uh, um, finished his teaching uh, here at the Naval Academy of my colleague. And this guy from Hawaii, he never liked being the midshipman here. He graduated toward the bottom. I think it's number three from the bottom. He got the loudest assignment to be a uh, so we command a bunch of like squad of, uh, of sailors somewhere in the Gulf of Eden. And the rubber boats, you know, inflatables, we chase the pirates. You know, he loved it. People way above him graduate to become, you know, uh, you know go to the new school and uh, go to Pensacola. And uh, you know, no, 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 he loved it. This is a real action. He should be the Coast Guard, I think. Yeah. He did such a wonderful job. A lot of actions, so much so that they would reassign him to the Caribbean to command a ship. The ship was disguised as a Coast Guard ship, but it's actually a Navy ship. Mm -hmm. So for legal reasons, somehow we cannot do that kind of stuff. But he did a lot of stuff. He came back, show us all these wonderful things. He actually sees a lot of contraband. We're not talking about just, just drugs. We're talking about the weapons, machine guns. And he's the, the most experienced former midshipman I've ever met. So much so, he was selected for command a month ago. The Navy is going to give him the ship to command. And this is a guy who really, really was like the McGibbon, on the very bottom of that. But the idea is, is not, is not it, it, it's really about, it's written about, you know, the time, you know, it's about time. And I think, you know, uh, there is obviously the time. Now, back to the, the McGibbon story. McGibbon, was a, obviously a very unique individual and the living in a very unique time when China is badly in need of uh, foreign assistance in building up its Navy. This is the time of self-strengthening movement. Self-strengthening movement was China spending a lot of mo money and efforts and to build this Navy. The Navy was pretty big in terms of tonnage by 1880s and everybody was feeling very robust. And uh, one thing that I should also note is why do you think Li Hongzhang, the, the son of the granddaddy of Chinese modern uh, uh, effort to build naval building, the commander of the Beiyang Navy, why do you particularly like this some 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 uh, American? Uh, and uh, why not just hire somebody who's much senior? There are plenty of people uh, hired, British, the, the, the French. Uh, that's because the Chinese had a very unique affinity, particular affinity for America. Uh, this went way back, particularly in the 1870s and 1880s. That was a very period because Li Hongzhang was one of the architects of the triumph of the Taiping Rebellion. The rebellion from the south that cost the life of 25 million. 25 million people were killed during the same time that the American Civil War was going on. <clears throat> how, many, how many people were killed during the American Civil War? 600,000. 600,000, okay. Compare 600,000 to 25 million. Okay, so this is a gigantic endeavor undertaking. The Chinese believe that American also just overcome the rebellion from the South also. Yeah. The Chinese did that. So they have this amazing intellectual historical affinity for Americans, and particularly those guys who are on the side of the North. So McGiffin represent that part of the, of, the, of, the, of the Chinese psyche, I mean, like that. And so much so, you know, the, the most famous American during the Civil War is who? U.S. Grant, right? Grant became president, but he was in China in 1879, I believe, just for back. And, and he received a hero's welcome. The Hongzhang, this guy, the commander of the Beiyang uh, Navy, loved him because they, well, it's a picture taken, you know, doing all the stuff. Right? And because he wanted to see the two architects. The victory over the rebels, north versus the south. So, Grant had a great time over there. So, it is in this history background that 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 the Hongzhou love Americans and love people get to know there, regardless of their merit and intellectual failure uh, at the naval academy. So, uh, so that's why I, I think that's 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 the history background that uh, we should also pay Now. Uh, Dr. Jefferson's paper also uh, uh, talked about the why the Beiyang Navy failed. Particularly in in epic battle like the Battle of the of the Yellow Sea, uh, well, obviously uh, uh, there is a historical narrative of friendly foreigners, and but actually that's kind of you know 
sorry, nonsense. Uh, the Young Navy failed for many reasons. One of the most important reasons, I think, is really the lack of a naval mindedness in China. China is a land country, and it really doesn't care much. Navy is important because Navy is important because all the guys who China wants to be, they have the Navy, right? The British and the French, the Japanese. But Chinese Navy was big, so they become very, very sort of uh, complacent. You know, one reason why the Battle of the uh, Yellow Sea, the Chinese lost, because all the Chinese boats, the ships, were much bigger than the Japanese in terms of tonnage. They're equipped with much bigger guns, but the Chinese use them as ship transports. They take up the, all the heavy guns and they transport the troops from Santo Peninsula to Korea, mm -hmm. where China and Japan were at all, at a war. So bigger ships, you don't have any firepower. That's how Japanese get it. So essentially, this is actually because they don't believe in this kind of naval thing. They believe in you know, transport. This, this transport army, soldiers, right? So that's why the army control a lot of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the orders over here. And then to, in a larger degree, why did the foreign, why did the self-strengthening movement fail? Right? Why did the 20 some years of self-strengthening movement fail? Uh, you know, of course, the idea that China had at the time was, hey, listen, if we have like a just a powerful gunboat, just a powerful ca uh, artillery, like the British, like the French, and then Kumbaya, China will rise again uh, without opting its many political and civil or institutions, uh, and the the uh, the story goes that uh, the Chinese uh, ships in battle they actually fire a lot of salvos, they hit the enemy targets, but fail to explode because those guys were in charge of making navy uh, uh, equipment, right? They be um, uh, uh, arsenals. They're very corrupt. Instead of putting spending money to put in a real gunpowder into the shells, um, they put sand in there. Right? So of course this has become the sort of Chinese uh, national narrative condemning the corruption of the Manchu dynasty. But but again, this is this is a, a, I don't think there is any historical truth in uh, facts that are found out, but it's spiritually there. There's a, a lot of corruption going on there. Uh, because without adopting a sort of a, a system of accountability in modern times, and uh, U.S. Navy is not just about the, all the carriers, all the ships, all the boats, right? It's about a whole system of accountability. That's one of the reasons why many members are here, because we want to train you uh, with all the rules for good stuff, ethics, morality, uh, and and the honor system. So I think you know I thank both of you uh, for this wonderful uh, presentations, and I personally learned a lot. So. The rest of it will be uh, for question and answer. So I'm done. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny. I my I have a question from the panel, but it was one thing you said about the cultural zeitgeist thing uh, that I think is relevant. And oh yeah, sorry. Hi, I'm Everett, and I work at NRL in my real life. Um, so my dad's a lost from Canada. My mother is. Greek and Spanish, right? And they have two very different ways of expressing themselves. My father is very much a just a fact sort of guy. My mother is very allegorical, right? She doesn't necessarily stick to absolute and solid truth entirely, but there's truth in the fiction. And there's uh, there's truth in the exaggerations of what she's saying, like the emphasis in the exaggeration, whatever, implies the truth there. And I think there's probably something <coughs> to be said for the nature of narrative, the narrative story, and even if it's not literally entirely factual, how how cultures transmit, um, how tra how cultures transmit the emphasis of what's important to them. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, is, do you have a question for? Yes, I do. But I just, sorry, but I did. Want well, to... just the one I have to comment. Uh, in the in the in a particular time that we're living in, it's absolutely important that we have the faith in truth. Mm -hmm. You you turn on the TV, you read the newspaper. I mean, everything is about the manipulation of truth. Not everything. I'm, I'm exaggerating, right? Uh, 
But but if you don't have the truth, if you don't have a faith in truth, and then you'll be very, very agonized. If you do, and then you'll, you'll be able to have your life. Right. So, yeah. And so my my question for the panel is Western powers have had serious involvement in the for like the last 150 years, right? Britain and the Opium Wars and France and Vietnam and all the rest. Do you think that part of the re or what sorry, let me try to get this in the one single thought. Do you think that part of the reason or what percentage of the I'm sorry to ask in terms of percentage, but how much of what the Chinese are doing, uh, the government of the PRC is doing now, is sort of as, I don't want to say, sort of a psychological revenge. And I'm sorry for that phrase, I'm not a psychologist. Um, for all the years of British and French mingling, uh, uh, mingling and things like the Boxer Rebellion, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, like, with the, and, and things like British, French, and American gunboats sailing up and down Chinese rivers. Like, there's got to be, like, a lot of cultural anger, it would seem, and it almost seems like the PRC is acting, we're going to get those guys. Does that make sense, or? Dr. Cole? Well, yeah, I think that I mentioned the missionary efforts in China earlier, and the fact that they had a great effect, in my view, in the modernization of China during the Qing Dynasty and, and afterwards. And because a lot of the news about China that Americans learned in the late 19th and early 20th century came from missionaries when they'd come home on leave or writing letters. And the missionary societies never hesitated to go straight to Congress or to naval officers stationed in China to complain and request assistance and, and so forth. So that by 1949, there was this belief in the United States that America was a unique friend of China. After all, during the Boxer Rebellion, we took the money that China had paid and we used that to educate Chinese students in this country. This feeling of, of uniqueness was not shared by the Chinese. And my favorite aspect of the Chinese reaction is a letter from a New England merchant in the uh, 1840s who had a trading ship in, uh, in, in, in Guangzhou, Canton, boasting that he didn't sell opium to the Chinese on Sundays because that was the Lord's Day. But he's happy to sell it the rest of the week. Okay. So there's a feeling of hypocrisy uh, that emerged in China, justifiably, I think. And from the Chinese perspective, the Americans were no better, were just as imperialistic and just as bad as, as France, England, Russia, Japan, uh, as anybody else. So I think that what that meant in 1949, in addition to the uh, worldwide fear, or the fear of worldwide communist domination on the part of the United States, when a communist regime took, took power in Beijing in October 1949, there was a feeling of real resentment in the United States. How could they do that to us when we have been the true friends of China? That feeling is simply not reciprocated in China today. And they uh, are sincere in their continued complaints that the United States continues to try to contain China and prevent China from attaining its rightful place in the world. Um, two ex very excellent talks. And I really enjoyed uh, your elaborating on Philo McGinn. I knew a little bit about him, but you really expanded our knowledge of what who he was, what he did, and its relevance to today. Uh, and also, Bud, your world view of, of China and the U.S. is phenomenal. Uh, one thing came to mind. You mentioned the Korean War, the Chinese interpretation of the Korean War. Well, I was in China, I think, six years ago. They were commemorating the end of World War II. Guess who won World War II in the Pacific? China. And I gave a whole talk on the advance across the Pacific, you know, dropping atomic bombs, we're ready to invade Japan. That didn't count. We fought the Japanese to, we beat the Japanese in China. No, no, um, not, the, not China, it's China's Communist Party. Oops. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. right. So totally different, <laughs> talking about truth. Yeah. Their truth is so different from our truth. Um, it, it's very difficult, but you have to as you've said in an excellent commentary, by the way. Uh, that's what we all should do, is be seeking the truth as we understand it, uh, and try to be objective. We're not totally objective. We have our own biases, uh, but we have to go for what we think would be the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can I just 
take a poll on here and just recommend the, the work of, of Rana Mitter, the historian at Oxford about this, who's written about China, who, who's, you know, a, a West, Western historian, quote unquote, who's written a history of China as the forgotten ally uh, in World War II, you know, and as a society that, ended, that lost to close to 10 million civilians and soldiers during World War II. And so, you know, I think this, is, this has to do with this idea of perspective, right? So you can make a serious case for who defeated the Japanese empire. Well, in, in terms of human casualties, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to, that's, you know, it's a huge delta between U.S. casualties and Chinese casualties. And so that's the case for me there. But also his, his, his follow-on book is uh, China's Good War and about how the reinterpretation of World War II in China is being used to undergird a new upsurge in nationalism today. And I think it's another fascinating intervention on the subject of history, memory, and, and the Second World War mm -hmm. in China. Yeah. Uh, so it was mentioned, uh, I'm sure it was our class prior. Uh, it was mentioned in the comments that China is traditionally, historically, a land power. And even now, the Navy is called the People's Liberation yeah. Army Navy. Um, what steps would you say China can or has taken to repurpose itself as a perhaps primarily naval power as it seems to be heavily focused on the South China Sea? Well, they're certainly, I think they're reacting as any rising uh, world power has reacted in terms of building a modern Navy uh, over, over the centuries. Uh, having said that, perhaps on the ground, the most significant thing is reorganization that, that uh, I first saw a brief on in 2013, but then was formally issued in 2015 to reorganize and modernize the People's Liberation Army. And uh, we did away with the old seven military regions and instituted five theaters. And the idea was that instead of every senior position in the military being filled by an army officer, for the first time we began seeing admirals and Air Force generals as these theater commanders. Uh, the Air Force general, who was the theater commander of the Southern, Southern Theater, which faces uh, Tibet and India, was just fired last week after two months in office. So he obviously didn't do very well. He was replaced by an army general. The Navy admiral, who was commander of the Southern Theater, uh, came to the end of his four-year tour again last week and has been replaced by an army general. So now we're back to the fact that all the senior positions, including the National Defense University president, which is far more important in China than it is in the United States, are now once again filled by army generals. So the reorganization is, 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 is not yet settled out. The other big emphasis that we're seeing is joint warfare, where Air Force pilots in the People's Liberation Army Air Force now actually fly over the water, something up until about 10 years ago they simply didn't do. Uh, I had a long discussion about this about uh, two weeks ago with a fellow who's the, sort of the primary U.S. Uh, expert on the People's Liberation Army Air Force and uh, about the lack of coordination among the services that still exist. In, in other words, the question came up about anti-submarine warfare. And I, I'm writing a book right now, which I posited control of Air Force jets flying out over the water by a Navy cruiser by their new Type 55. And this fellow came back and said, no, they don't do that. Air Force aircraft are only controlled by the Air Force AWACS or the ground bases back at home base. And so I went back to him and said, well, how do you do ASW when you've got helos, fixed wing and ships off try and maybe a submarine all trying to conduct operations? And he didn't have an answer for that. I think there's still serious steps that the that the uh, People's Liberation Army is trying to take to modernize, particularly with a focus on the Navy, the new rocket forces, and the and the Air Force. But before we get too critical about that, the, the Goldwater-Nichols bill was enacted in, what, 1986? And think about how hard we still are struggling in, in our military to try to coordinate Air Force, Navy, and, and Army operations. It's a very tough thing to accomplish. But to go back to your question, uh, the Navy is still ranked way behind the army, I think, in, in China's sort of military hierarchy. But they're certainly making a lot of progress. Let me just uh, add to that. Uh, there is also another aspect. Uh, so Cole mentioned that uh, in the Chinese uh, military, uh, Navy in particular, uh, the guy who's actually in charge of uh, the rank, all rank the commander, the professional uh, commander, is the political commissar, which actually is very telling. Um, so there's one of the reasons why uh, the Navy or Air Force is behind. Because in terms of uh, what what is the president's Communist Party does? What what really is the most important to the Chinese Communist Party who commands all the military is a political and ideological loyalty to the party, and that's number one. You know, I, I was reading this memoir by the former Chinese Air Force Chief uh, Wu Fa-shen, who was sacked after the Lingbao East in 1971. He was an Air Force Chief for over like 10 years, uh, uh, mostly 60s, and he he revealed in that memoir, which is very telling, 
the number one job of the US of Chinese Air Force is always how to prevent pilot detection. Taiwan or to, to South Korea at the time. <laughs> that's the most important thing because that's more than anything else there. And in the Navy, for example, if you think about the Navy, right? Air Force and the Navy, Navy and Air Force are different from the Army. They have a they have a much bigger operational independence. Right. This is Captain Ramis uh, dilemma. Right? Do I trust my skipper, commander of a uh, a boomer, right? And give him all this high high tech stuff, and it, and how do I make sure that he goes to the, the second island chain and, and never come want to come back? Right. So that's the reason why you think, if you look at the promotion, if you look at the promotion, I mean, part of the commerce source get promoted much easier. <laughs> Than, than, than the professional commander. So that's one reason. I'm not sure that's the reason. But in terms of in terms of the army, however, is the bedrock of the Chinese uh, Communist Party. Uh, uh, forces. I mean, they've been there, model tested, and much easier to control. So that, that's that's my uh, concerns. Two two quick other things. A, a delegation of, of the PLA Air Force officers visited Maxwell Air Force Base in 1998. Uh, a bunch of 06s and 07s. And uh, one of the reports was translated by the CIA under the old FIBIS system. And one of the things that surprised me was that the uh, Chinese Air Force guys are surprised at how much uh, a political training goes on at the officer training corps down at Maxwell Air Force Base. And that really kind of set me back. But what they're classifying as political training is get out the vote, treat women equally, yeah. racial harmony, uh, buy bonds, all these sorts of things that we in the U.S. Navy used to classify under general military training. You know where you go to divisions in, in the morning and and whatever the lesson of the day is uh the other thing is i mentioned earlier i went aboard my first chinese ship in 1994 and the last one in may 2014 so i observed a lot of interaction between the ship's operational co and the ship's political commissar and i think what's missing and i agree fully with what, what professor you just said but i think what's missing is there there is a personality issue here i've been on chinese frigates where uh i told the co i wanted to visit the combat information center and he engaged in a conversation with a political commissar who didn't want me to visit the CIC and I ended up visiting the CIC. I've been on other ships where I don't think the operational CO would have made a head call without the political commissar's permission. So I think personality matters. Absolutely. So, so, there, uh, so the Naval Academy, this place, has tried for many years to establish an exchange program with Chinese Naval Academy in Dalian. I was in every single one of those delegations. The reason we couldn't do it because their mission men, they also called a forget mission men, spend about 30% of the time every day learning Marxism and Leninism and uh, Communist Party leaders. <coughs> and uh, the whole brigade was run by by the uh, mission men party members. Right? So people report on each other. I mean, it's just really, really different. So they said, okay, you can send your mission men here from, from Annapolis, but we're going to house them. Separately, we're going to study to totally separate, separate from not going to be integrated over there. We said that cannot be done, and they said, Well, no soup for you. Uh, so they want to send their officers here to do RD. I said, We don't do RD, and they said, Well, we say, Well, we don't no soup for you. So that's one that's very systemic, that's a very a different kind of the Navy culture. And then, you know, you know, the uh, the Chinese Navy also very heavily influenced by many doctors, but you know, the Chinese spreads place a lot of uh, emphasis on their submarine forces. You know why? Because the Soviet Union did that, right? Mm -hmm. Soviet was, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's transforming, but also uh, politics doesn't matter. Um, speak of uh, uh, political uh, uh, training in the US, is, I just got the email this morning, seven o'clock from our HR people. I have about 10 training sessions unfinished. I gotta get it done by end of <laughs> this month. And so that's basically, it's very interesting. Several years ago, the, the number one political commissar, the most senior rank uh, PLA military personnel was the vice chairman of the military commission called Xu Taihou, General Xu Taihou. He was number one commissar. He came over and spent half the day talking about our ethics training here. He was very fascinated uh, by our system over there. But, you know, he went back to doing what he did, um, that he had to do. And uh, like a year later, he was purged mm. and he died. <laughs> Any last last question? We have one minute. Yeah. Just one question for Dr. Jameson and uh, Theo Mafia members uh, for life. Uh, I was a Navy in 
did too long ago. They are famous uh, uh, people like uh, your character. Did he set the stage for people like Claire Chappell to start positioning American adventures and having him that was overseas or kind of a one-off kind of thing? I think there's something, there's something of a, it, it is, it is a tradition of the military adventurer or mercenary in China. Yeah. Certainly runs through some of the period that Dr. Cole has documented so brilliantly. Of course, the post World War One period is primarily a German show, because the demobilization of the German military after World War One created a surplus of expertise with modern violence yeah, that could yeah. be had on the market, international market, quite cheaply in China. Now, that's primarily. It's primarily a story of, of sort of German intervention. Oh. But I, I think we can see him as a distant echo or, 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 or an analog, but not necessarily, not necessarily someone who's causally related to someone like Carson Altman. It's kind of a, it's not really an unbroken line of people. No, no, not at all. But it is an interesting echo. Yeah, okay. it's an interesting echo. Okay, so with that, I think our, our, our reservation for the room is up. Uh, thank you very much, the panelists, and thank you for participation. Have a good day. That is a fascinating anecdote about